Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, CEO of Spiderworks, a leading business consultancy for mid-market organizations and entrepreneurs globally. With me today are Franco Taverna and David Kepis from CompanionLink, a nonprofit aimed at helping combat social isolation with a focus on elderly people. Franco and David, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Great to be here. So we're going to be talking um, quite a bit about companion link today, about combating social isolation, uh, focusing on the elderly. But Franco, just to start, I mean, you're a professor, you focus on neuroscience. So talk to us about neuroscience and the human brain and, and why why social connections are even important to us in the first place. Sure. So it's long been known that uh, social, social isolation has a very negative impact on um, psychological health and even physical uh, health. The um, presence of a, a, a connection, a social network, whether that's family, friends, uh, or otherwise, even, even professional uh, connections, connectivity uh, around a person is strongly correlated with all sorts of uh, life outcomes, quality of life, uh, and health, welfare, and especially psychological health. The, the neuroscience of that is, is fairly straightforward. You, if you talk about the, the opposite or the, uh, the opposite uh, isolation is correlated with stress uh, and anxiety and loneliness, and that's very corrosive to the brain. It's corrosive to uh, parts of the brain that um, are very important for engagement, for activity, for uh, just getting up and doing stuff. And, and that ends up being uh, very detrimental to, uh, to someone's health. So a pandemic would definitely not be top of the list then for, uh, for mental happiness. Oh, absolutely not. Yes, of course. Okay. And, and David, um, Look, your background isn't neuroscience, but I've seen you've won some wonderful awards for public service. So obviously, giving back to the community in different ways is is very much who you are and what you're about. How did Companion Link specifically come about? How did you become involved or, or help to develop that? Thank you, guys. Uh, it's a great question. I I sort of wonder that sometimes myself. Um, and but but my journey uh, starts in this space uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, and, and it comes from personal loss. Um, so both my uh, grandparents were at a long-term care facility in Toronto that was the site of one of the early major outbreaks of, of COVID-19. Both my grandparents contracted it. Uh, very fortunately, my, my grandmother uh, is still alive and, and with us today. Unfortunately, my after a few weeks after contracting it, it, my grandfather seemed to recover, but he he passed away shortly thereafter. Um, and you know, if you sort of cast your mind back to that time, you know, in in May June of 2020, this was the start of the the depths of the lockdowns, right? right. And particularly for vulnerable people, folks in long term care facility. So I I approached the home uh, with my wife and and another friend of ours at the time. And said, "Hey, how, how would you feel about us FaceTiming the residents just to keep them company?" Um, and that's really sort of how we we started. And it 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 grew over the next several months. I found friends or friends of friends that were interested in doing similar stuff. And then, kind of through a serendipitous connection, I, I ended up linking up with uh, with Franco. You know, we we experimented with doing this with with uh, one of his classes, uh, which you know Franco is as he'll tell you has been motivating people to do volunteer, motivating young people to do volunteer work and get involved with their communities for a long, long time. Um, but of course, a lot of those traditional volunteer opportunities had dried up uh, because of the danger, you know, posed by the pandemic. So I, I spoke to Franco and I said, hey, we're having this, you know, really rewarding experience. It's obviously completely COVID safe. Uh, you know, it's, it, it seems to be working. Um, why don't we try this? And, and the success that we had and the interest that it generated, um, we sort of looked at each other in early 2021 and thought, well, you know, maybe there really is something here. 
uh, you know, digital technology and its adoption has come, has come so far. And we should really think about maturing and professionalizing sort of a, an or, and scaling an organization like this. And, and it has just completely taken off. And it's been an extraordinary journey. So, so at the root of it, just so we understand, companion link, it is virtual, it is ways to connect um, with seniors who are who are isolated, either at home or in homes. Is that? That's right. So in, in, in a very, very, very basic um, level, we ask our volunteers for a minimum six month commitment, uh, a minimum of one call a week. Uh, that's, you know, and you could go, you can go and do much more than that if you'd like. But the, the objective of the program is just make a friend. And and Franco, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's important that he he sort of does add some of that academic context and and you know the statistics that are out there about um, you know how like the debt you know it could be loneliness can have a horrific effect on mental and physical health, but even just in a romantic sense, can you know the the you cannot overvalue the feeling of being valued of having somebody who knows that you exist who's interested in what you're doing, wants to hear your voice, you know, and, and wants to be your friend. And that's really, that, that is the heart of what Companion Link is about. That rings so true, um, that whole notion of being valued. Franco, as David is describing this, he, he talked about involving one of your classes, because obviously as students, and I have three kids, three stepkids, most of them are completely through university, but I saw the isolation there. You mentioned um, your students. Did, did you test it? Did you use it in, in a classroom at first? Like how, how did building the model um, or building the, the situation sort of come about with the help of your students? I've been teaching a course all about uh, aging, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease since 2008. And with a neuroscience uh, lens, it's for a neuroscience program. But from the beginning, I valued uh, experiential learning. So I arrange for my students to become friendly visitors at long-term care facilities in and around uh, the U of T campus to simply become a one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one visitor. It was always one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't uh, you know, to go and run the bingo. It was a one-on-one -on -one visitor mm -hmm. uh, for the duration of the course. And we very quickly kind of adopted or not adopt, realized that the goal was simply making a friend for the students. It was an educational experience as well as a social experience. They learned about aging. They learned about living uh, with uh, Alzheimer's, with, uh, you know, the cognitive uh, decline that happens. And, and they had to overcome it. They had to be, be become capable and experts in communicating and in, you know, holding conversations week by week and what to say. So that went on for, for 15 years, 14 years. So wow. let's let's step back 12 years until the beginning <laughs> of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which uh, very abruptly and tragically cut us off from all of our friends, which and it was near the end of the course. So we've been doing this for a long time on an in-person basis. To the credit of uh, many of my students, they, they were quite distraught by this, as all of society was, of what was going on in long-term care. But they had a they had a personal connection. Uh, like David did now in, in long-term care. So they, they bandied together at the after the course was over, even months after the course was over, to try to reconnect. And the only way they were able to reconnect was virtually via telephone calls. And that started to happen. Uh, I was helping them. I was uh, joined their effort and, and um, they created an organization to do that. And that's what inspired Companion Link. Uh, the idea, hey, this is this is something that is uh, quite beneficial, uh, and it turns out that it's not only beneficial to the to the senior; it's also beneficial to the students because uh, they were getting a lot out of it. We also realized that very from the very beginning in two thousand and eight that there was there was big challenges in even getting regular volunteering, in person volunteering happening, mm -hmm. and the 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 type that we were doing with um, telephone calls and things like that, we're no different. There's a challenge to do that. A and so Companion Link, along with the, the simple uh, goal of creating uh, connections also um, grew or, and came to be as, a, as an organization that was trying to overcome the challenges of making it happen in the first place and making it happen well. It's not easy right. to form any friendship, let alone an intergenerational friendship, 
So, you know, everything that I've learned over the last uh, 14 years has gone into mentoring, training, and, you know, providing learning opportunities for students to start the friendship, to nurture the friendship, to grow the friendship, to, you know, uh, do activities with their senior and to form a bond there that, that could be, you know, very beneficial uh, to both, to both parties. So, yeah, I'd been doing it for a long time, but not virtually or in person that came out of necessity. And the next year that my course was offered in a virtual world, the university was half virtual and half, you know, in person, we weren't able to go back in person for two, for pretty much two years. So we adopted the com virtual companion called model and companion link became one of the conduits to do that. It, it became a, um, a vehicle for the course students to, to, to get their, um, uh, they get their experiential learning uh, done uh, as well, which was, it's, it's, it is a, I, I can't underestimate the importance of that because it's very difficult to make this happen out in community, out at long-term right. care. So there's a, there's a real need for the things that companion link does. Now you, you both touched on um, the one-to-one. -one. So David, is there, is there sort of a, a magic to that one-to-one -one relationship versus one-to-many? That's a, that's a really good question. And, and part of it, I think, will have to be answered by, by Franco. Um, what I would say is I think the data um, that we've been able to find is pretty limited uh, about the, the efficacy of sort of different you know, styles of call program. Although what limited data there is, is quite positive and quite promising. But in terms of sort of drilling down into the differences between, so for instance, like we, you know, we, we saw a, a study early on when we were doing our, our sort of environment scan, there had been a, an effort to make, you know, many phone calls in a very short period of time to sort of reach as many people as possible. But, you know, it didn't sustain contact. It didn't build a friendship. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you just sort of having experienced the program, having worked with our volunteers, worked with our clients, I think in, in anecdotally, I can tell you that in my opinion, it makes all the difference in the world, um, you know, because you you overcome the the feeling of, of being a stranger or an acquaintance. Um, and, and you know, as, I think as, as anybody has experienced, there is magic in having friendship in your life. Right. And, and so to to be able to go and, and build that, forge it and and nurture it is is a completely sort of different thing and, and one that I think really gets at the heart of tackling loneliness. Take me through some of the steps in, in, in scaling it, if you will, because David, you said it, it took off, but I mean, I've been an entrepreneur a long time. Things don't just take off. There's a lot of passion. There's a <laughs> lot of work. I, I appreciate the humility, but I'm not, I'm not totally buying it. There, there is a lot of work that the two of you have done. T tell me about the steps from those first calls to to, to this phenomenon today? It's so first of all, uh, there's there's no sort of addressing this question without um, addressing the team that we have. Uh, so of course, you have Franco and I um, on and, and we're uh, of our sort of core team, probably the most involved in the day to day operations. But speaking from just sort of an entrepreneurial aspect, if if I, you know, sort of have some of that entrepreneurial energy. Um, Franco brings a lot of the academic expertise, and, and we're actually very fortunate to have another professor at the University of Toronto, uh, Dr. Arlene Estelle, who, who's also with us, um, again, sort of bringing that academic expertise. This would have gone absolutely nowhere um, without two sort of other people very, very critical to our effort, um, one of whom, a gentleman named Al Turnbull, and he's a lawyer, um, a corporate lawyer, uh, and another a uh, gentleman named Adrian uh, Katz, who uh, is is sort of our tech guy, um, and and to speak to the elements of both of those in terms of organizational capacity, uh, as I'm sure you know, you know, translating sort of academic theory or or uh, you know esprit de corps and and sort of eagerness to do something, translating that into an actual sustainable, functioning, legally compliant organization is is a chasm that that is quite challenging. And, and I unquestionably would not have been able to, to do so without the expertise of, of some of these other some of these other folks. You know, from there, I, I think really the lifeblood of uh, I mean, whether you're for profit or not for profit, of course, the lifeblood 
uh, is is do you have any funding? Um, and so there's a, there's sort of different ways of of pursuing funding. We were quite fortunate to we have this just incredible partner um, in the Mississauga Halton area. Uh, they're they're not a long term care facility. They're actually a community service organization called Nucleus Independent Living. They um, have been around since the the, the 1980s, and and they support seniors who are aging at home but need help. Uh, and, and so they sort of run teams of service service workers. They really liked what we were doing. Um, and, and we partnered together for, for uh, like some grant uh, writing and grant applications. We were fortunate to get some grant funding jointly, um, which allowed us to sort of pilot, you know, our model with a number of their clients, uh, improve it, test it, and, and scale it up. And then since then, uh, we've been able to, to secure funding from, from some other sources. We're actually just in the process of hiring our first uh, full-time employee, uh, which will come as a, a welcome reprieve uh, for all the, the nights and weekends that sort of our core gang have been, have been putting, at, uh, you know, putting into this for the last two and a half years. So it's, it, it has been this, this journey of balancing scale in terms of, of growing the number of, of folks that we're reaching uh, maturing the model uh, and ensuring that all the right pieces, all the right ingredients of how to actually grow an organization sustainably are are present um, and ready to grow. One of the things, and David just you know touched on it, was scaling. Um, you start with a group of students who who well understand the process. They go through your course. This is what they care about. This is what they study. This is what they want to learn and be a part of. How do you scale the quality of community as you go to more and more seniors who will require more and more friends? But again, I'm, I'll, I'll dig deeper. I mean, these are friends who understand how to make a connection. So how do you, how do you scale that in community? Uh, there's, there's two sides of that, right? One on the volunteer side and one on the seniors or on the client side. The volunteer side is what we've most uh, been working towards, scaling that. And that involves technology. It, it involves systems, apps, and, and other online processes to greatly accelerate and facilitate the intake, screening, you know, police check. These are, these are things that over the years have been uh, a, a bane of my existence with respect to getting opportunities for just a small number of students to become right. friendly visitors in long-term care. The capacity it's a challenge for that, right? So, so we have invested and are building a system to do that on our own, to take that burden off of the client side, intake, all of that stuff, right? Processing. And then all, layered on top of that is the learning opportunities for students. So we have created uh, online modules for everything students need to make their first phone call and really thought deeply about what should be in there. Those are offered online, but we also have adopted a philosophy of high touch, high communication with volunteers. This is a, a challenge for most organizations that use volunteers. How do you ensure, you know, a well a motivated and well prepared uh, volunteer? Uh, and and that becomes a capacity issue. And, and for us, part of it is online. Part of it is with regular in person or rather synchronous, just like we're doing now, right? Zoom right. teams, um, opportunities for students to speak to us, to, to have a community of practice, to share successes, to share inspiring stories, to share tragedies, to, to share things that are going on. So this has just become part of the system and all of it can happen within the applications that we've created. So we've created an application that that can, um, where volunteers can communicate with us, we can communicate with them, we can query them, we could uh, survey them, we could provide training, um, and they can even make their connection with the senior through, through the application. On the client side, the scaling up or the scale piece has come initially, and so far this is as far as we've gotten, through our partnership with a service provider. They have a roster of hundreds of, of clients and this has become a very uh, welcome service that they can they can provide at very low cost, uh, and it, it's it's turning out to be a a much demanded 
uh, opportunity or much demand from, from their clients. It's things that they cannot cannot provide, right? They're, they're, they're too busy already providing the services for necessities of, of daily living and socialization is 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 a you know a, a difficult thing to provide on top of that. So that's that's what we do. We do the volunteer piece, and so far our partners have done the uh, the client piece. Our vision for the future is that the client piece can can happen um, at scale in a in a in a somewhat automated way, just like we're doing the volunteer piece uh, for especially for you know. Uh, seniors that may be living at home, but uh, right. but that's those are the the, the the pillars of sustainability and scalability in the organization. We we certainly feel that we're in very sort of uncharted waters. You know, things have the the adoption of digital technology, particularly with say you know video calls, has changed so dramatically in such a short period of time. Um, it you know it's it's really accelerated. I, I think trends that were already there. Um, and, and, you know, to sort of name two of them, uh, one is, of course, we know that there is a, a significant number of older adults who are aging in Canada, right, far more so than, right. uh, you know, in terms of ratios and percentages of the populations than we've ever sort of been used to dealing with. Um, but another factor is, you know, every year that passes, the, you know, folks who are considered the uh, in the category of, of older adults are increasingly tech savvy. Um, you know, if I, if I think about, you know, in my, my own parents or loved ones, um, you know, they're, they're either sort of in or, or, you know, or on the cusp of, of that sort of cutoff and they're very tech savvy, you know, this type of technology does not scare them in the least. Um, so, you know, I think you're, you're sort of, you're facing two very powerful trends um, that will encourage and necessitate the involvement of digital technology in delivering healthcare, um, and I, I include uh, loneliness and mental health in in that umbrella right. um, to uh, seniors and elderly uh, in in this country and 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 you know for beyond its borders as well. Um, what that will look like, what role digital technology is going to play very undefined, I think. Um, lots of experimentation, lots of um, research, lots of, lots of idea generation that's, I think, happening now. Um, and and it's, it's kind of exciting in a very, very sort of tiny way to be, you know, sort of part of that and thinking about it uh, and, and trying to see how can we meet the needs um, of, of these people uh, using these, these, new, these new mediums and, and uh, vehicles. So, so as you build the community and you build it through technology and you've talked about the intergenerational learning, what the students take away, and I, I fully appreciate um, what they can take away from people who've lived a few more years from, um, from them. Is there, um, is there another side of building the community in the sense that, yes, there's the aging population, Yes, we have students, but there's a lot of midlife people who are alone who could use a friend. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing, Franco, they could go online, go through the modules and learn. It just seems like there's, there's a learning and sharing that can happen between all of the ages. Oh, for, for sure. So that's the other big benefit of technology. It's really, you know, target agnostic. So, well, we are focusing on intergenerational uh, connections between students at the moment uh, that age and and older adults. Um, we we know from research is there there's an interesting kind of relationship between age and loneliness, and, and in, it's not linear. Indeed, some younger older adults are amongst the most lonely, and the oldest older adults. So there's a, there's so so the yep. ones that you just mentioned. Uh, might be an interesting, uh, uh, you know, demographic and target, and and that could bring some advantages with respect to access and and use of technology, as as David said, right? So, uh, however, but having said all that, the the platform you can put any two any two people uh, in the mix here. So, right. could that be 
you know, um, a younger senior with an older senior? Could that be, well, just like David has, as has he's been telephoning and many of us have been telephoning uh, or video calling, FaceTiming grandparents and their friends and lots. So it could be any age um, that, that get together. And in fact, the, you know, the, the social isolation or the loneliness uh, phenomena is, is, you know, generalized, especially during the pandemic. So there are some efforts that are that are targeting everybody, not just uh, seniors. Right. Uh, the the platform can be used really for any kind of connection uh, that happens, and along with that, any kind of training, any kind of um, mentoring or learning opportunity uh, that comes with it. Um, you know, having said all that, we 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 have recognized the. The, how powerful the platform might be, right? Especially with respect to some demographic issues that are very, very helpful to to um, make young people aware of. So in, in our case, aging, we have mo learning modules that we've created um, that are dedicated to aging literacy. We have them uh, dedicated to crisis intervention or at least awareness and an ability to respond, to identify, uh, recognize, and and refer. So, so you know the the connection is not only a friendship, although that's what we always focus on. Just have fun right. with a friend, but with that training that happens, that can be extremely powerful and helpful. The the one or the other can become an advocate, can become a um you know can can monitor right can can uh you know these these kinds of things that that can come just naturally from any give any given friendship is there a part or will there be a part of this community in the future where they can continue to connect like the volunteers with one another um or or the people you're connecting with um in the community is is there sort of an ongoing camaraderie that's that is or can be built there are, again, different ways to answer that question. I mean, on the volunteer side, for instance, we, we host regular, uh, we call them community of practice events, uh, where we, we bring volunteers together. Uh, we often have sort of a guest speaker to talk about a, a relevant subject, give them an opportunity to share their stories uh, and, and talk about, you know, their experiences, what works, what, you know, what concerns or issues or challenges that they run into. And then, you know, there are, we, we, so the call program, you know, if we sort of consider that the core of what we do, um, we've done uh, some experimentation some, and some research and development in broadening those, the, like the ways in which people can connect. So just as an example, last year, we uh, worked with uh, a couple of our partners to distribute uh, 50 activity kits um, to, to clients. And so you, know, you can, the theory of that being sort of, you and I might be FaceTiming, but if I send you arts and crafts supplies, uh, we can do arts and crafts together. Um, and e even though it's, it's virtual, you know, Franco has made some, some references to the platform that we, uh, that we built. We're about to pilot next year um, in which uh the, both the, the, the clients and the students or, or the volunteer, I should say, because, you know, not all of them are, are students far from it, uh, you know, are in the, that environment, um, you, you can host online games, right? So you're sort of on the phone and, right. and you say, oh, well, you know, I'd absolutely love to play dominoes when I was younger. Or I love to play chess. You're like, great. Well, you know, the, the platform can do the online chess, online community. So, or uh, forgive me, uh, uh, online dominoes. So, there's, you know, we really encourage um, our volunteers uh, to to uh, to make that friendship, you know, for where that friendship goes. Uh, you know, they have they have lots of latitude to, um, you know, I, I visited my uh, uh, my sort of counterpart a couple of times, uh, always always safely and in line with all the uh, all the the restrictions, um, and uh, you know, did Christmas presents and and so I think it's. You know, we we like like nothing brings me greater joy than the the you know that friendship growing and that sense of community growing. Um, and as Franco has mentioned, you know whether it's the training, it's the tools. The more that we can do to facilitate and empower that, the better. You know, companion link um, the work that the two of you are doing. It's and 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 a lot, with a lot of help, obviously, and support. It's it's an incredible thing and. Um, 
As our time comes to a close today on Say Hi to the Future, just the last question is really why Franco, why David? Meaning almost everybody recognized the, the need around social isolation during the pandemic. The two of you did something and, and that's very, that's unique. That's wonderful. But what, what drove you um, to, to not just talk about the issue, but to attack it? Well, I look for me, and and I think a lot of people uh, come to causes this way if it impacts them them personally. You have you know personal tragedy. It it really sort of aligns you uh, to to the the challenge at hand, um, and that's absolutely the kind of experience that I that I underwent. You know, in in I I love public service. Uh, I I believe in giving back. Um, so so I was maybe the you know, I had the right, I was the right, I had the right character to be impacted uh, or, and, and sort of undergo that. But I will say, uh, the, you know, I also, I got lucky um, because I, I strongly suspect that there were lots of people out there like me who wanted to do something. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of path to do that wasn't clear. Um, and the path for me was largely illuminated by meeting these, these sort of key people um, and going, okay, you know, that makes sense. We could, you know, we could do that. Um, uh, that sounds great. I'd love to push that forward. Um, so I was just very lucky to connect with Franco um, and, and be given the opportunity to, to, to rise to that challenge. I think I concur from, from David, the, the serendipity and of, of meeting people who had the same motivation and, and, and passion and, and some, some, you know, missing capabilities from my part on, on how to do it. That, that goes a long way, but I too had a, had a dad, uh, have, have a, had a father who um, lived through the long-term care system. He passed away in 2017. So, you know, far before companion link, I dreamed and envisioned of, of the, you know, the, how he would have enjoyed having a student visit him and talk to him and interview him and learn about his life the, the activities that my students have been doing for a long time. So, you know, I'm very lucky that I have this opportunity to uh, to be in the, at the university setting with students and get to shape the kinds of things I want them to experience. And experiential learning uh, like this, uh, for me, is just un you can unmatched with respect to a learning opportunity. So the motivation to continue to uh, provide that for students with the double benefit of, of benefit to the community you know that's 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 always been what's what's driven so then then with my with my father but when when you know I met uh, David and then the others that are now involved the path became clear it's like look I've been trying to do this for a long time not so much the virtual that was new but um, it's hard it's it's just not easy to do and with this group that came together uh, those uh, impossibilities became probabilities, and and so I, I just jumped on it, and and we're, you know, we're almost there. We're getting there. <laughs> One of the uh, really interesting experiences about being in this space is when we connect with people. Almost invariably, they can empathize with what we're doing because whether it's been a grandparent or uh, a parent or a loved one. You know, so many people will say, my, my goodness, like I had to help my dad navigate getting older, finding, you know, the right care. And it was an awful experience. Um, and, and so almost invariably, there's that instant connection. And but you know what, I think to anybody uh, who's sort of thinking about this, you know, hopefully, and the odds are, we're all going to get there one day, right? So, so I think, like we, we all ought to be invested in building the world that we want to age into. It shouldn't be scary in the ways that it is now. Um, and, and if we can do something to, to make that world happen, like that's motivation enough for me. David, what a perfect way to end. We should all build the world that we want to age into. Thank you. Thank you, Franco, for joining us on Say Hi to the Future and best of luck with Companion Link. And I hope you will come back and, and let us know about the progress. We will. Thank you so, so much, Thank Ken and, and Sonia as well for helping organize this. It's just been wonderful. Thank you.